I hope you don't mind I started with that. I just want to make the point. We, we've been talking about um, private associations for a while, and I just wanted to review a bit of that. We can talk about it too, and maybe if you have questions, but I want to make the point that the World Economic Forum is one of the organizations that's pushing the agenda you guys are observing right now, and you're trying to plan your life around this. <clears throat> but it's interesting because, look at this, the World Economic Forum is an international, non-governmental and lobbying organization. I could name another organization that fits that same criteria. How about the mob? So how about a, you know, an international baseball team or something? I don't know. I mean, it's a private club. And, and George Carlin is excellent about you know, consolidating an, an overview, a broad view of the whole thing. And yeah, sure, it's funny the way he says it, it's funny. But we have to realize that we're dealing with uh, a private association of, as it says here, a thousand member companies. What kind of companies? Companies that sell us stuff, companies that we buy stuff from, right? And I want to make the point that a lot of the things we're looking at, I mean, everybody's looking at public offices, government systems, and they want to criticize the IRS and all these things. But the real power behind what's going on in our government or or system, maybe our political system, is, is where the money is, of course. You guys know that. But um, where is the money? Well, first of all, the money comes from us, right? And we just don't see what it's being used, how it's being used against us. We're starting to discover that now. But if you go back about a century or so, 120 years, and you look at the Rockefellers and all these rich guys, the Vanderbilts and these people that brought in some of our infrastructure and created our, what we have now, you know, the oil systems and all this, fuel distribution, um, those families set up endowment funds with the university system. So you got Harvard, you know, all the big ones, Cornell, uh, Yale, Stanford, uh, what else? Johns Hopkins, that's a big player behind what's recently happened in the last few years, okay? <clears throat> and they're doing all kinds of evil things, but like Harvard, for example, Harvard has a $50 billion portfolio of, that's what it is, an endowment fund is a, is a portfolio, it's an investment portfolio, right? I believe Harvard's investment portfolio, its $50 billion fund has about 14,000 different types of assets in it. So the propaganda, if you will, or the, the rhetoric that was to get everyone into the college system like George Collins making fun of is designed in a way so that you will go into debt and, and fund these, the profit that's being paid out for the investors of these endowment funds. And the investors in the endowment funds and I'm just, I'm just going to make a wild statement here that I have no foundation whatsoever, but you guys can figure this out. I mean, if you did some research, you'll see that it's kind of like this, okay? It's these guys. So we're paying for our own demise. You just realize where, where the money's cycling through. Yeah, some of it's coming through the tax system. The SEC is, is there to prevent the consolidation of capital. So is the IRS, but they're there to prevent this consolidation of capital. So are all the other you know three-letter agencies that deal with this stuff. But you see how we're talking about private associations and what's the solution? Vote for another president? Nah. Now, because what what is a private association like this World Economic these weffers? What what is what is, what are they able to do? They're able to get into a country. They're able to infiltrate your local governments, and this is admitted. Uh, and they're able to influence policymaking, and you through propaganda influence all, uh, create all kinds of nonsense that we've been witnessing. All right. So what does that do? That gets around treaties. That gets around laws, that hijacks your government. So what may be the solution? Well, if I can come up with a way to live my life that doesn't depend on or is not enormously influenced by these creatures, hopefully, I don't know, that's what I guess we're all trying to do, and, and still you know, do a thing that people wanna do, that wanna participate with me, well then, okay, that's maybe the solution. If I come up with a better idea and a solution to something, like if you wanna criticize the phones, for surveillance, well then come up with a better idea, you know? So I'm just wanna make the point that what we're fighting is our own money, right? That's probably my way of explaining it. George Carlin is way funnier though, of course. But um, I don't know, I just wanna start the call that way and um, leave it open and just, I'm gonna, you know, just reviewing what we talked about two weeks ago um, on uh, the PMA. And then last week I was talking about, um, well, the PMA on how to emancipate 
a profession mm -hmm. from the state regulatory framework, okay? The way we do that is with independent autonomous licensing, accountability, regulatory compliance within the association, and also funding and indemnification um, and dispute resolution, okay? Dispute resolution through ad hoc juries, we can use technology for that. And then the, um, uh, the, the indemnification through captive insurance, which must be outside the banking and insurance system that we have today. Um, and by the way, captive insurance, it's there. We can utilize some of these. Some of these. Uh, so anyways, let me get this real quick. Um, and then, of course, uh, last week I was talking about how uh, these private associations can be managed and how you can relate with each other, giving you examples like the PTA, school systems, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, uh, the rules for arbitration that we can adopt into our own PMAs for our families and our local businesses. So uh, anyways, I'm going to do this mute all here. So, so anyways, I wanted to open this up for Q and A, and that's all I really want to say is just start the conversation like that. And I, I want to introduce something next week. I was it was my fault for not being able to bring this person on this this evening. Um, he was he was so nice to be willing to come on and talk about something. I don't want to ruin it. I think it's a really cool uh, thing this guy did, and so I want to share it with you. It has to do with raising capital for a really cool venture, um, using technology, but using it to enhance something that people have been doing for a long time, okay? And also it's a, it's a great example with this gentleman, and he's from Columbia, by the way, and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk to him next week, hopefully, more than likely, and I'm gonna explain, maybe he's come up with something that uh, would compete with this, this uh, association that uh, we all demonize, okay? Anyways, uh, does anyone, anybody want to, you can bring up anything. I mean, it's open. Um, you guys want to ask anything? Are you working on anything? Did you want to comment on our content from last, um, last couple of weeks? Yeah, and Todd, I got everything. I didn't forget about you. <laughs> Okay, well, good, then uh, I'll just end the recording then, and then uh, we'll just end the call, unless you guys want to ask something. John? Yeah, John. Okay. okay. Oh. Yes, go, go right ahead. Oh, this is Ray. Hey, Ray? I just, uh, just take a look at the Telegram whenever you get a chance. Okay. Okay. All right, we will do. Hila, hey, how you doing? Did you want to say Hi. something? Um, hey. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted, uh, my question is about the, the banks that are um, shutting down now. Um, and yeah. uh, how safe are our banks currently? I mean, they're not, but um, are credit unions nowadays less safe than, than large banks? And I think credit, credit unions have a unique exposure to the car market. You can check it out. Um, it, it's, it's really bad. I think it's bad. I don't think that they're reliable. I mean, I'm no, I'm no professional expert on that subject. I, I'm like you guys. So yeah, what you see is what you're, you're getting. You're observing something. If you have a question about it, it's probably true. <laughs> are, are the banks a problem? Oh uh, yeah. So what do you do? You know, you try, you try to use the banks as least as possible. Um, I, I always tell people the same thing, you know, try to keep money that seems to be sitting in your account. If you're running a business or something, it's just sitting there and it, you use some of it, but it's still the others start sitting there. Maybe put that in some cryptos or some precious metals, more likely precious metals, because I can sell those, right? And then try to use, you know, use the banks. I still have cash. I keep cash in, in my hand, you know, in a vault, and I go to Walmart and buy a money order to pay my rent. And I've been doing that for years. So mm -hmm. I know it sounds crazy, but I mean, now I'm starting to pay the rent for like most of the year. So, because what happened is the, the landlord raised the rent and she's raised it $500, 30% over one in one year. Mm -hmm. and, and she has to, I, I totally, and she came over, she was actually apologetic doing that. I said, please, it's okay. We were already under market value anyways. I just didn't want to say anything. She goes, yeah, she laughed. Mm -hmm. and, and they're really, and they're so humble. They're just breaking even. And so what's interesting is when I explained to my wife, I said, because of the way we bought precious metals, we can actually pay the same rent for like the next year. So it won't matter. We, we, we got around that. So but that's what it's for. It's not trying to, you're not trying to get rich off of gold. 
What do you think? Mm -hmm. Do you hear anything special? <laughs> no, I, I just don't know. I mean, before that, I, I thought that credit unions are, are better, but it seems that, um, that now they're, they're trying to, to um, crash those first and especially those that are involved in crypto. So yeah. Okay, so you can pull the balance sheet and see what their exposure is to like the used car market or the consumer goods or whatever. But I, I believe it's not just by chance or that they're failing like, like a company would fail naturally. I think it's deliberate. I think they just finally said, hey guys, let's turn the lights off. <laughs> let's turn the lights off and then see what happens. And that's what they're doing. I think the, the Silicon Bank is a way to see how people are going to react. Bank of America doing stuff, taking people's money, Wells Fargo, mm -hmm. in different areas. I think they're testing to see what people will do. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's an actual, an actual problem. They're creating that. Right. You guys get that feeling maybe? Do you... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so just expect more of it. Try to stay as far away as you can. I know some of you have your hand up, but uh, Elaine, mm -hmm. would you want well, I think a lot of this is they want to scare people away from cryptos. Okay, or frustrate them into accepting something. The CDBC, yeah. The CBDC, crypto. And they won't see it as cryptos, by the way. I think you're right. I mean, I think they're going to see it as another phone app. As I even hate to say that word, phone app. I never download a phone app. But yeah, they're going to do download the phone app or you can't buy groceries here. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. they want to frustrate people. I think that's the end game. In in New York City, um, one of the fairway stores, like one of our best small supermarket chains, mm -hmm. just, uh, I mean, they've been, I think they've been doing it for a long time, just announced that they're using facial biometric <laughs> recognition to stop theft. BS. It, of course, yeah. it's a lie. Of course, it's a lie. So, um, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if you went into the store and, you talked to the manager said, I really don't want you to collect and store my biometric data. And uh, since you're doing that already, I'm just telling you that I don't want you to do that. But I would like to see your policy on how you're managing that. Can I see a copy of that? Because <laughs> mm -hmm. now I have an interest in that, right? Um, and, and we can talk about that too, about biometric data and this sort of thing. But sure. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, uh, uh, I'm going to get to you straight in just a second. I just want to make the comment on the... Um, on the funds, okay, so the endowment funds. An endowment fund, I, I meant to define what that is. An endowment fund is where you would put, you would gift money to, it's tax deductible, you gift money to a charitable purpose, and usually the university system is a great way to do this. And then you earn a dividend off of that. Um, it's called restricted funds, right? So, and there's interesting, interesting scenarios around that. But I believe that these endowment funds have been used to launder money or reward the type of policy making that you're that you've been seeing that you've been, become aware of in the last few years it's it's a little complicated but what i'm thinking is these funds require nonprofit organizations to be connected so what i'm thinking is if enough of us like pick a fund like I, let's pick the biggest one right I go after the harvard one and, and try to break it so what you do is you try to challenge the nonprofit status of all the nonprofits associated with the fund. And then you try to get the government of the state to, to annex the funds, take it because the money is being used for evil purposes. So it's just some thoughts I had on that. I meant to share that earlier. I'm, I'm sorry to drop that in now, but it's just something to think about. I don't know if that solves the bank problem that Hilo was asking about. So, um, but yeah, Stray, what did you want to bring up? I had a question about, I had two questions, but um, so I've been learning about whole life insurance and I know that the banks are quite unstable as it is, but if they were to go down or continue with where they are now, does that change um, the use of whole life insurance? Like if you were to use that as... Um, if you have a whole life policy, that's that infinite banking concept, if it's that type of yeah. setup... Yeah. Those do not rely upon the banking system, from what I understand. I think that those, I don't even understand that. How they, I, I was told by the agents that I, that I spoke with in Texas, the two guys, they said that it's, these are 200 year old instruments or system or whatever. I don't know what they're doing, but they are not using the banking system. They would not be affected. That's I, what I thought. I was, uh, I don't know if you've read that book, What Would the Rockefellers Do? And it goes into huh? like some pretty intricate details or whatever, but I just didn't know, <clears throat> know it. Yeah. 
I can only speculate on why it wouldn't be influenced. But yeah, I mean, I would think there would have to be some safe haven and that only the super wealthy would know about that. And yeah. maybe the internet banking has been introduced as recently, you know, we're one of the few countries in the world that actually do that. We're probably using infinite banking around the world. I mean, the infinite banking, the insurance companies, and, and by the way, insurance is a banking facility. It's, it, it has actuarials and everything like that. Right. I, I think that those funds, they have to be somewhere else around the world, not necessarily in the banking system, but I don't even know what it is. Maybe it's land. I don't know, contracts, something, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I would I would feel pretty safe with it. Um, I mean, I really don't know what to think, but that would probably be one of the safest things if I have to use a lot of money doing something. Um, yeah, and, and also on those contracts, I wouldn't put a small amount of my net worth. I mean, if I have, whatever my net worth is, I wouldn't put a large part of my net worth. I wouldn't put a small amount of money there, uh, like $2 million. I, I would put $20 million, but I would plan on keeping it forever, like generations, at least 20 years. Um, I'll, you know, tens of millions for a long period of time and only use it to, uh, for what it is designed for, which is lending out for investment purposes. Right. Never yeah. That was the goal. That. Yeah. Good. Um, I think that's, I mean, good... I don't, I'm just trying to figure out a structure and then, you know, make the money as I go, but I don't have the, I'm not already yeah. there, but yeah, I'm just trying to figure out the bulletproof kind of structure. And are we all, I mean, you've heard me talk about all this. So, I mean, I don't know what else to tell you guys, except what I'm thinking, you know, trying to tease the bank so much and, you know, all the other things. Hila, I'll call you afterwards. Um, thank you, Stray. Uh, Greg? What hey, John, I had a question about um, uh, multi-member LLC and bank accounts. Okay. Um, I've tried to open up an account before, and since right now I've only got my name on the paperwork. Um, when adding another name, does that need to be filed before giving it to the bank or... You just put it on a piece of paper, give it to them. You don't owe the bank anything. Um, you can tell the bank whatever you want when you open it. If they'll open the account, then that's that's what they need. If you make changes to your company, you're not under any duty to inform the bank. It doesn't help you to do that. It actually hurts you in some cases. So yeah, but, I would. In, in many cases, we do a single member LLC and then we amend the articles afterwards. Because I have a single and when I submitted it, they said there's only one or a, I have a multi and it had just my name on it. And they refused to open the account. So I kind of changed the paperwork to say that it was a single. And then they said, because they were reading everything about it, and they still refused to open the account because they said that I was not the only person that could make decisions on it. Okay. Well, yeah, if it's a single member, make sure that your documents say that you have the exclusive rights to make decisions. If it's multiple member, make sure you identify who has those rights, if both or one of you do. That's all they want to see is something that's consistent with who the signers are. But anything modified on the documents, does that need to be filed with the state? You can do or that. No, no, the articles does the articles don't say that. It's the documents usually that I provide if they're if they conflict. Sometimes the banks read them. Uh, yeah, this one actually good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, also um when they collect information, they collect the same information for the same purposes. And I just write up those documents so that it's already done. And so fortunately they are reading them. So sometimes we do have to make adjustments. I do start with templates and uh, they're, they're for you to amend. And that's why I put the instructions in the readme file. So okay. definitely just keep that in mind. And also if the bank doesn't want to open the account, be sure that you get details as to why, because a lot of times you'll, you'll hear the detail and then you'll know what to do. Or if you ask me for help, I'll know what to tell you, you know. Right. It was just because sure. I had a multiple, I had a single and then it said that I was not the only person that can make decisions by myself. Yep. So. And so all you do is just say, oh yeah, I've got to change that or something. And there's give them an updated one okay, because gotcha. that, you have the right to do that. Yep. Okay. Thank you, John. Yeah. All right. Uh, Ray. Yeah. Hey, John, on that subject of the banks, everybody's talking about, yep. you know, it, what, the issue with that Silicon Valley bank is the same issue that pl plagues all the banks when you start reading about it, and it was all created from the COVID uh, quantum sure. injections. Yes. Then they, to, to offset the inflation, they raised the interest rates. Well, the bond markets for years, they've been saying, if you raise the interest rates, bond markets don't collapse. And all these banks, their main uh, financial investment to uh, provide supposedly the security and safety of the investors, of the depositors, is treasury bonds. And sure. treasury bonds are listed as volatile. It's, it it was intended that way. It, it was intended to time yeah. it that way. I mean, this is not uh, by chance. So it's everybody. And you're... they have to do that. They have to take the system down because that's what it's designed for. It's designed to steal everybody's money until it gets discovered. And just before it gets discovered, because the people that aren't paying attention are about to discover it, but they're going to quickly change everything you'll see. 
are going to try to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll connect everybody to the big banks, too. On probably destroy mm-hmm. the small banks, you know. Oh, you got it right. Yeah, yeah. They're going to consolidate everything. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I mean, I, I think they're consolidated now. I think they've been consolidated for a long time. So when I say consolidated, what I'm talking about is think of your brand name bank that everybody understands, Bank of America, Wells Fargo. They're probably owned by the same people, people, institutions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In fact, they're probably owned by your local friendly Harvard Endowment Fund. <laughs> Black Rock. <laughs> I mean, um... Yeah, Crack Rock and all these creatures. I mean, uh, what else would you own with a $50 billion fund? What else is there to own? Own the thing that it's, 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 it's being used to exploit 330 million people or more. Makes total sense. Yeah. It, it, with the banks, it's the same thing with the, uh, have you heard about, they're going to, they're talking about building 15 minute cities and they're going <laughs> to. Right. There's about what, 30 of them or so. Yeah. The, to the 15 minute <laughs> cities. Or, I'm kind of uh, glad they're doing that. I think they're going to realize that it's a disaster. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they, maybe people like me, they'll just wipe us out with some robot to come over and yeah, kill me or something. Well, people are going to go along with that. Most I know. Well, and those that don't go along will be replaced by the AI robot, you know, DARPA or something. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think George Carlin, you know, he died recently, I guess. And he, mm-hmm. I don't think he saw the labor force being replaced by robotic systems. You know, no, I don't think that back not back then. Automated yeah. systems, uh, yeah, whatever. Okay, <laughs> I'm out. Yeah, good comments. So, so I'm going to answer some of these questions here real quick. Uh, is there anything we can do with the unconstitutionality laws that have been passed? Yeah, petition. I mean, <clears throat> these laws. Okay, so what do we do with the with the laws that we don't like? Now, there are some laws here in the state, in the state of Florida, for example. I mean, these are the kind of laws we want. We want a law that says. Uh, if you're using public funds, if you're benefiting from public funds, you're not going to be promoting critical race theory. You're not going to be promoting a racist ideology. Okay, great. Let's do some more of that. And I think a lot of that's happening in, in Florida. It's just the problem is it's not happening everywhere, but there are things happening in other states. Like I just saw one in Mississippi the other day where the government created a a funding tax benefit, let's say, a tax benefit for companies to help moms out, you know, because they just outlawed abortion. You know, they they want they want to support moms uh, and, uh, and, you know, they want to be pro-life and proactive, not just anti-abortion, right? So uh, there, there's a lot of these things. And also there, there's a collection of states right now that are dialing back some of the really um, harmful uh, rules or, I don't know, s- standards or laws, statutes in family court that, that are used against the, the father. You know, they kind of throw him to the curb and, you know, in many states and, and, and they're dialing that back a little bit. So there is some progress. And, yeah, we do need some laws for that. But, yeah, we do have some really ugly ones coming. They're going to keep on coming. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, if we're real specific, then it, I think we have a solution. I always think we have a solution. And I always found a way. It's, it's just like the work I do every time. I mean, you, I've been doing this for 30 years. And every time there's new laws, everybody says, John, I'm doing this now. Then I look at it and sometimes I've had to modify some of the things I, I've done, but I've always been able to deliver the same types of benefits, no matter what the laws were, because there are certain things you can't get around. And I don't I don't see that changing. The thing that bothers me, though, is uh, forcing us to connect our biometric data to the use of money. And I think that's a game changer for everything. And I don't know what to do on that one yet. I have an idea. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, yeah, we can call it unconstitutional, but. I don't even know if that matters anymore. I think a lot of times we could just ignore that or do something outside of that system. I mean, like me, I don't file tax returns. I run a businesses and, you know, and I'm not doing anything illegal. I'm just, I just change the way I do things. So I just ignore that system. I don't care what the laws are. I don't deal with the IRS. They never send me a letter. They don't care about me. Never had a problem with the IRS. Yeah, you do. Money orders too. I know. I don't mind. It's kind of fun to get out of the house and, you know, get a money order. Uh, whatever. Uh, I just changed my attitude on that. I, I have published books. Um, mostly it's on consumer debt, um, uh, about 15. I stopped doing that around 2012. I stopped doing that. But the content that I, I talk about now is the latest and greatest version of those books. I, I kind of migrated into doing videos and and, and seminars like this or you know, uh, conference calls. It, it's better because I could talk to people and answer questions. So. Um, chance to look at documents. Yeah, I'll, I'll look at the documents. I'll, I'll take care of that, Todd. Um, okay. 
Okay, so if you have an LLC, if you need to access money and use money in cryptos and you want to use it for managing a stock portfolio, yeah, it does need a bank account. Um, if you just have an LLC and you just want to, so for that, it's going to need an EIN. If you're using an LLC just to hold title to real estate, it doesn't need a bank account. Or maybe it might need a bank account some, some years down the road, right? Maybe. Um, so, yeah. So, okay, so you had to bring it up, the lean on biometric data. So what I'm thinking is so Google, Apple, and your DMV. I mean, pretty well, pretty much everyone you deal with is collecting your biometric data. What is that? It's my face. It's the image of my face. It's the way I walk. It's the way I talk. It's the frequency of my voice. It's the unique color that is reflected from my eyes. Okay, it's my fingerprints. All these things, DNA, and all this. So because it's mine, I can have a unique claim on it. Right now, it's abandoned property. Right. So if I can describe it and I can say it's my property, well, then it is. And if I if I establish the priority claim on it, the lien, I put it in the public, right? I, I reg register that, record it in the public. I announce it, right? I put it with the Secretary of State's office, the county recorder's office, maybe with the U.S. I don't even know what office with the U.S. But anyways, if I have established lien rights on something, it would be very much like Marilyn Monroe's estate, similar to that, Michael Jackson's estate. Did you all know that Marilyn Monroe's estate is actually still in business? An estate is a business, right? Uh, so is Muhammad Ali's. Muhammad Ali sold his likeness in 2004 for $50 million. Now, I don't know what good that is because after his time, people don't know who Muhammad Ali is or was. I imagine it's worth a lot more now. Whoever put that money into it probably had a really good reason. But if a famous person who has a high net worth can do that and call it his likeness, much like intellectual property, I can certainly do that with my property, my body, my physical features and things of that nature. Um, I can do that just like someone who writes a poem and publishes it and has the exclusive copyrights for it, right? I'm not saying copyright it, I'm saying put a lien on it and then you can impose terms on the use of that property because the Supreme Court was kind enough to say, yeah, you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the public. OK, fine. Therefore, I'm going to put a lien on the things that you're using by violating my privacy. That's how I look at it. And once I put a lien on it, I can then impose terms on you for storing, using and collecting my biometric data. Why not? Famous people have been doing that for a century. So I didn't invent something. I'm just telling you, why shouldn't we be doing that? But thanks for bringing that up. I um, have already in my mind, I think it's the way to go. I have an instrument that can be used, I believe, that describes everything that would be a person, one of us, that we could use in the lien. So the lien has to make a claim and it has to describe the property on which the claim is being made. And I think that I have a document that does that. I'm not ready to publish it yet, but I will share it with everyone and you guys can try it out. I'm going to start trying. I haven't done this yet. Um, there's another thing too I'm going, to, I'm going to just mention in that same context, and that is claiming uh, rights over your biometric data and then imposing licensing terms, for example. That's one thing. The, another thing that can be done, I think, is where you have a strict liability, like for example, a driver's license imposes a strict liability. Strict liability means that you eliminate the burden of proof on the state to establish what's called mens rea, right? Your state of mind to, to committing a violation. And then you eliminate the need to have an injured party. That's why, that's why they can do this with traffic court. There's no injured party, but you still got to pay up because it's strict liability. Well, I think we can divest ourselves of having strict li liability, even if we have a driver's license by simply um, disclaiming that in the public record. So that's another subject we can talk about, another way of managing risk. It's another subject. I'm not sure when I'm gonna to get to that, but I just wanna throw that in since it was on my mind. You guys can remind me, that'd be awesome. Is anyone else wanna bring in anything? Oh, you want me to elaborate? <laughs> what, on the strict well, liability? It's interesting what you said about claim rights over biometric data and provide licensing. Sure. Yeah. That's what that's what a likeness is for. You you uh, describe property property rights, and then you call that your likeness. If I write a book, I'm going to call that my intellectual property. Every attorney understands what that looks like. Every attorney understands uh, how to write a licensing agreement for that. It's old school. That's hundreds of years old. Um, and so why why couldn't I just do that? 
So they'll go in default on the on the licensing fee, though, probably. It would give you a cause of action for the ballot. Yes, okay. It would allow you to come in and, and make a claim against Google or whomever. Imagine making a claim for the value of your likeness that Google refuses to acknowledge, and you've already have a perfected lien, right? And you come into court and you enforce uh, your lien rights. And what's the judge going to do? He's going to have to. I mean, if he if he doesn't do it for you, why would he do it for a famous person? So mm -hmm. the system is already there. So yeah, and and we can we can have a claim and and we can make the allegation when it comes to let's call it the the violation of intellectual property rights. Let's call it the copyright violation just to keep things simple. Mm -hmm. There are certain elements of a pleading. So if I were to sue someone for a copyright violation, um, <clears throat> sure, I have to make certain allegations, but they also have to be supported by facts, and you should be fairly easily able to get uh, the facts. So like, for example, your DMV. I have my driver's license in my head and you can see my photo on there and where else would it have come from? <laughs> it came from the DMV. Hmm. So therefore, <laughs> don't tell me the DMV does not have this record, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, so how do we how do we show that Google has um, my information. Just go ask it. It'll tell you. <laughs> you can get that on the search on the internet. Yeah, yeah. All right. So yeah, you, yeah. it's not hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. It tells hey, you everything you do. They are like this with it. Yeah, I got the data. Let's do something with it. They were going to, it's a commercial thing. They, there's no way they're going to deny it. They're idiots. They can't deny it. You're, you're going to, that's easy to prove. The question is the valuation of it. You know, and the question is going to be, did you give adequate notice? Did you perfect your lien? That's going to be their defense as far as I can tell right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the other question would be, are they going to, you know, incorporate new language into their term to service that says, you know, by using our service, you're giving us uh, the right to any lien on your likeness? I don't know. That's interesting. I don't know if that would, that would have any legal effect. Um, I don't know. So dealing with anyone is going to constitute a waiver. I mean, they do it right now with employment agreements. I was looking at one today, and the one thing that stood out was the employment agreement said you waive your right to a jury trial. I mean, we're we're working at a job. We're being productive in this world, okay? And we're paying taxes, presumably, to fund the functions of government, one of which is a jury trial. I mean, the Greeks came up with that, and they they had wars over this. Many people died to keep the jury. And yet, in order to work in this modern society we're being required to waive those rights what how long are we going to tolerate that i mean so if we're going to tolerate that maybe maybe the, what i'm saying is just naive maybe the companies are going to say yeah if you're going to use our phone then you irre irrevocably waive your rights i'm not sure if that would stand i think that's an unreasonable condition like if the, if the use of the phone required a, a blood sample or something, that would be unreasonable. Or if it required you to um, commit to a certain religion, religious practice, right? I think that would right, be unreasonable. To, yeah. Like let's say you use Google Docs and you put your business's intellectual property into a Google Doc, and and Google's like, well, you know, you forfeited your right to your intellectual property by putting it into this document on our server. You definitely got to fight that. So you could probably make a parallel argument to, sure. hey, this is no different than if I put my business document into Google Docs. Yeah. Um, yeah. So waiver would be a defense. So we got to be really cognizant of that. The other thing is, if you had an option, like for example, um, if I want to interact with somebody, like I, I set up a, years ago, I set up a, you know, when I go like have things done to clothing, like repair stuff, alterations. I, I don't give my real name to those people. They have my phone number, but they don't they don't have my real name. I think they call me Jack or something like that. Whatever. It doesn't matter, but it's just a practice that I have. So where you have a choice to not disclose whatever, like for example, instead of my palm print, what would I use? If I was prompted at a point of sale to use my palm print for more convenience or something. And if I really wanted that convenience, but I didn't want to get my palm print, could I use a thing? You know, this might be a product you guys want to create, a product that's a palm, right? And so you put this on your hand and it's just, it's a key, right? It's not your hand, but it's a palm print that will become a unique identifier to that transaction and you're still anonymous. 
And if that's the case, then the defense would say something like, well, you had options. You could have used a, a phony uh, thing. So I don't know. But imagine if there are all these claims out there, I don't think that the people using our data are insured for this. And I don't think it's part of their business model. It's an unexpected cost of doing business. And I don't think they can recover from it. I don't think they can recover by increasing prices or something like that. And what about cost of litigation? Let's say we're totally wrong and only a hundred people do this in one town to the DMV. I mean, just in cost of litigation alone, that could be a hundred times thirty thousand dollars. I'm just making up a number, but you see what I'm saying? It could be something. So yeah, I mean, okay. So we have all these, you know, title uh, title eighteen cases. Fine. <laughs> I just think we should get away from that stuff. I mean, we gotta have other solutions. But yeah, it, you know, it, it, that's probably one thing we could do is use the court system. But all right, guys, I'm gonna end this for now. Appreciate the the questions. All right. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. All right, y'all. Um, enjoy your weekend. All right. Thank you, John. Bye. Good night.